ми би хотіли почати з визнання того, що земля, з якої транслюється ця подія Торонто, є традиційною територією багатьох націй, включаючи Месосаги з кредиту, а не ще Нагбеги, Чепева, Гадонушоні та народи Вендат. І тепер є домом багатьох різноманітних корінних народів. Ми також визнаємо, що Торонто підпадає під дію договору 13 з Месосагами з кредиту. Заохочемо вас дізнати більше про землю, на якій ви знаходитеся. Welcome everyone. Вітаю вас. My name is Anastasia Bachinsky and it is an honor to welcome you to SVI's Learn How to Make Pesinka Traditionally Using Natural Homemade Dyes. Indigenous peoples always acknowledge the land at the start of their gatherings, ceremonies and events. It's important for us to start this event with a land acknowledgement because it gives time for reflection and demonstrates respect for Indigenous treaties, lands and people. We're all accountable for honoring and respecting this history of our land. We're also grateful for the friendship and support that Ukrainian Canadian settlers received from the Indigenous people when they first arrived. They continue to help Ukrainians today by contributing financially to help Ukraine in its current battle against invaders and also by raising awareness about the importance of respecting a shared past, specifically by wearing kokum scarves, a symbol of humanity and resilience. We are dedicating this event to the Ukrainian people who are fighting bravely for their freedom and to poor democracy. Pisenkin are in fact protective talismans. Ukrainians believe that the symbols on the egg protect all life on earth. It is our duty to make them in order for the earth to continue. May our thoughts and prayers be heard and may Ukrainians soar above the horrors of destruction and continue the tradition of our beautiful culture. Slava Ukraini! Ця подія буде проводитися переважно англійською мовою. There are a few technical items to bring your attention before we get started. Uh, please keep your audio muted. You're welcome to keep your video on if you like. However, muting your microphones will allow us to better focus on our panelists and their comments. Um, there will be an opportunity to engage with panelists via chat. Uh, the chat feature is at the bottom of your screen. If you have your mouse along the bottom of the screen, you should see the chat icon up here. It's the second from your left. Uh, please type your questions in the chat in Ukrainian or in English. The chat box will be monitored and we will try to incorporate as many questions as possible. Um, uh, please be aware that this presentation is being recorded. Allow me to introduce more about St. Volodymyr Institute or SVI. It is a multifaceted community organization in downtown Toronto, housing a 46 room uh, student residence and providing a home to 13 organizations, including the Ukrainian Museum of Canada, Ontario branch, and the Seuss Foundation of Canada, which is its founding organization. SVI is also a public cultural and educational center with a theater, library, and event spaces. Uh, it is a uh, community hub uh, uh, providing cultural programming, creating language lessons and uh, social events. Cultural programming is key to SBI's vision, mission, history and legacy. It's key to strengthening the identity and community of individuals of Ukrainian descent while making an important contribution to the national culture of Canada. Uh, now I'd like to tell you more about our workshop leader today, Bojana Hritsena. Bojana is a passionate about community engagement through ritual, art, song, and the potential for healing through craft and traditional ways of living. She has facilitated uh, many community gatherings since 2010 within the Kwasa Collective community and beyond, and has been involved in the revitalization of traditional Ukrainian and Eastern European musical traditions, especially Ukrainian women's polyphonic singing. Her professional background is in history, literature, and education. And she has spent many years volunteering as a mentor to youth through PLAS and Help Us Help, as well as working with, as a teacher. She now resides in the Ottawa Valley. Welcome, Bojana. Okay, um, so I'm going to show you some of the results of the onion skins, even just last night, just to show you um, what I had. I had a white egg here. Oh my gosh, yeah, you can't see with this light. What is, I'm very washed out, but I wonder if you can see this at all. No way. Yes, a little bit, yes. Is it orange? Do you see the color? Okay. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's like just pure white. I don't see anything. Okay. Um, so this was a white egg, a white chicken egg that I had pure white yesterday. I simply drew the design and I put it in a yellow onion skin dye that I had just made. Yeah, golden orange, exactly, perfect. Yeah, I just see white. <laughs> fine. Um, and this, this lay in the dye bath overnight and that's the color that I got. So it's actually more of an orange. Um, so if I, if I want it to be more yellow, I might just do a quick dip 
but it seems like this is still going to be a pretty like orangey tone um, for for my um, color scheme. If I want a really pure yellow, maybe I will do something before I do onion skin. So what I suggest, which is easily available for most of us these days in our modern um, you know, multicultural kitchens is that we do have turmeric. Turmeric works wonderfully. And um, the examples I have actually are not so bright. They're a bit faded now, so you probably won't see it in this light. But here's one I made several years ago and the yellow in that. It's just kind of a sunny bright yellow is turmeric. Turmeric isn't as light fast as um, some of the other dyes. And I just mixed up a safflower uh, dye this morning. So some of you got the kits, you got the safflower, or some of you got turmeric. And safflower is basically, it's like a relative of saffron, but it's cheaper. It's really readily available in um, Asian grocery stores. And so that's um, a really nice one to use because you can even mix it with the um, with the turmeric, but this one is like the flower petals. So you don't get any powdery residue, which you would kind of get from the turmeric powder. You can also use um, fresh turmeric root, which I've used, but I don't know, I still um, prefer this over turmeric. This seems to kind of hold better and it's a little bit easier. So um, what I did here, this was actually powdered safflower. I just poured boiling water in here and mixed it up. If I wanted to make it much um, even even a little bit brighter, I would add alum. So alum is the modifier that um, is suggested for most um, dyes to just brighten them. So if you want to bring out the warmer tones, um, you'll add a pinch of alum. And really, it's just a pinch. You don't have to add very much. And you just stir it in like to dissolve it fully. So probably while it's still quite warm, um, not when it's cooled down. And you don't have to, like I still get Good results, no vinegar, yeah. It still get good results with this without alum, but it doesn't hurt. And alum is also readily available. So those of you that got kits got a bunch of alum. Here it's powdered. You can also get more pure alum crystals. Alum is used a lot in natural dyeing. And if anybody's familiar with natural dyeing for fabrics, um, it's used to it's used actually to treat the pre-treat the fabric most of the time before it's actually dyed. And then it might be also used in a lot of the bright colors to um, make them take. So this is a modifier that's good to have in your natural dye, um, I guess in your kit, in your natural dye pantry. It's used in, um, you can find it in the spices section in the supermarket because it's used to make uh, preserves crispier. So um, for those people who make or um, yeah, other canned kind of preserves, you've got to you've got to add a pinch of that, and it it kind of keeps it crispier. And uh, this is sort of a again a modern invention. Again, it's a chemical right that's been produced um, so that people can make money selling it. Like uh, traditionally, when people made pickles, how they got them to be um, crispy is they would add tannins, tannins that are naturally found in nature in these tannic leaves and barks and twigs of plants. So this is kind of what people promoted when they were trying to promote products for people to buy. Like so much is just because companies want to produce things for you to buy them. Um, yeah. Sorry, we have a quick question about vinegar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to go into it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so generally for natural dyes, we don't really need vinegar. So vinegar is something that the aniline dyes need. Um, I think I mentioned that a little bit in my instructions. So from my experience, when I was just experimenting in the beginning, um, I did always add vinegar. I thought that's what you have to do. And of course, I also learned that you have to leave the egg in the dye for a long time with natural dyes. So then I had this effect that the vinegar does, of course, which is it etches the eggshell and then it would make it rough or I would have to deal with this um, travunka effect. So that's not really desirable for us um, because we often have to leave uh, the eggs like overnight or at least for several hours. So the vinegar will just do that and we don't really need it. Like they will take without the vinegar. So it, it is an acid, like alum is acidic as well. And so that might be something you do want to add to some of the dyes to um, brighten them and to make them, yeah, exactly, um, to make them avail, uh, kind of, um, yeah, just a lighter tone. But then you wouldn't want to leave it in there too long. 
So that's my suggestion for some of the stronger dyes that you don't have to leave in too long, you could feel free to put vinegar, but again, it's up to you and your experimentation. If you like that kind of etched effect, then that's fine. But generally we don't need it. Um, can I just take a look here? So I've got some um, white and light, light green eggs to show you. And I'm just actually gonna dip them in some of the dyes that I've brought and we'll see in about half an hour, like how, how far um, they get, just a pinch of alum. There's no recipe, just pinch, it doesn't really matter. It's just gonna be a little bit. Um, I'm not accurate about these things and I don't think you have to be. It's not that, um, it's not that precise, the chemistry of it. And, and again, like because we're dealing with um, natural dyes that are in their natural form. Like here I have the safflower petals. I did have the powder, but if you're using the petals, you could weigh them or something, but like, do we really have to get that precise? I would just like do a teaspoon or a tablespoon and depending on how much water you add, how little or how much uh, dye stuff you put, it's up to you how strong you wanna make, how concentrated you wanna make it, um, how many eggs are dying, how much water you're gonna use, how big your jar is, there's so many factors and so it's it's more nuanced it's like it's more giving also um yeah there's so much to say so i'll kind of try and catch all of those things thank you for all your questions that helps um okay so i'm just going to stick this uh bluish green egg it's very very light green it's really hardly got a tint so when it gets um dyed you can't even tell that it was green i'm going to stick this one in the safflower just to give you a sense of how it'll be in about half an hour Roshanna, yep. can you put uh, maybe move show the egg oh, on your yeah. left because the light a little bit the other the other way the other side. Oh, this Colors is better. better than, yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. All right. I know. Like I even hung all these cloths, but it's not doing anything. Okay. Um. Yeah. So that's safflower powder. Uh. Because I had some because somebody randomly left it at my house, and when spices go old, I don't want to waste them and I don't want to eat them. So I use them for dye. Whenever there's like old oil, I save it for polishing my pissing kit. So when things are stale, it's like great to use them for other purposes or dry them or save them or freeze them. Like you don't want to ingest old spices, right? But um, really useful for other things. Um, but I do have a lot of fresh safflower that I just bought. And I bought that um, at the Asian grocery store in Ottawa. I just spotted it. You can also find it at Herbie's Herbs in Toronto and probably just a whole bunch of Asian grocery stores. I doubt that, um, yeah, it just depends on your neighborhood, I guess, what's available, but I doubt that you can find it in just any plain old frills or grocery store, but you might be able to. They come in big bags sometimes or smaller bags, and it just looks like saffron, but the price difference is enormous. Obviously, like saffron would be like $8 for this or something, but you get a bigger bag. Um, yeah, so this is the safflower. That's great. We can also use turmeric for yellow. Um, now, a lot of books, Ukrainians mentioned that they used pear bark. Uh, sorry, apple bark. Um, People also use chamomile. So chamomile seems to be pretty effective. I haven't had good luck, so I just gave up on it. Basically, if I try something and it works really well, I don't keep trying different things, right? If I have something that's readily available and it gives me a great result, then I'm happy with that. Um, I encourage you to try whatever makes sense to you. I just want to make piss and kiss. So I'm not about like finding every dye that's possible out there. Um, and I always use uh, raw full eggs. No, we don't cook them. Cooking is not a pasimka. Cooking is uh, boiled eggs or krasinka that you will crack and eat for Easter, but you would never make a pasimka and smash it and then eat it. So that's not a pasimka. So pasimka are um, traditionally not emptied. And there's kind of more I could say about that, but lots of people obviously empty them to keep them and to display them. Um, I do empty them sometimes, but I usually empty afterwards. And... Um, I just, yeah, a lot of times don't empty them and keep them and use them for ceremony and bury them later because they're not meant to be kept forever. And I would just have a million pissing and I'm not really interested in that. I just keep some for display and it's really nice to empty them if you're gonna travel around with them and show them to people because uh, if you crack, it's pretty unpleasant. Actually, I just had a bunch in my car a couple of weeks ago and I thought spring was here, but then we had a really, really cold night and actually they all cracked the full ones. So, you know, it is good to empty them. 
if uh, you're teaching and you're displaying, and of course, if you're a Pisanka artist and you're doing this for display, but uh, the eggs um, do dry up. They can and most likely will dry up over time. And the inside uh, takes almost up to a year sometimes to dry. And if it doesn't, then it might just kind of stay, there might be actually rotten in there, but it doesn't always smell as long as it's had enough uh, air, like enough space to off gas for the gas to escape and it hasn't been trapped in anything. Um, it won't necessarily stink. So yeah, that's a little about that. Um, the purpose of a pisimka is, is a prayer, right? It's um, uh, intention made manifested through through this symbolic language of the Pisimka. So it's about the process and it's about the intention while you're making it. And I think that's part of, uh, you know, tied very much in with the natural dye making because the natural dye making itself is also a prayer and it's, it's very intentional and um, relational. You're actually having a relationship with the process, like the plant matter or whatever you're using is, is interacting with you as you're making it and with the water and whatever else you're using. So it's um, always going to be different and it's always going to be really alive. And so what comes out, the result is always going to be slightly different, right? Like anything living. So it's so different from using aniline dyes. It's so much more satisfying and um, unpredictable, but also much more rewarding. I mean, usually all of us know that have made piss and kit that when we finish, we're usually surprised. Like it's, it's always still a surprise and a miracle and delightful, um, but it's even more so because really with the natural dyes, every time you get some phenomenal color, it feels like even more of a gift, right? Because it's what that color has chosen to become and it's a gift, so it's, it's amazing. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about that and not emptying the eggs and using raw eggs and, um, Sometimes people mention the wasting of the egg. Why don't I just empty them all and eat them? Uh, it certainly feels like that when you're doing a whole bunch and you're just pumping them out like to sell them. Uh, that changes everything, right? Changes the meaning and the relationship of you to that substance. But when you're just making a few and it's part of our spring ritual, the egg itself inside the life that's there, whether it's fertilized or unfertilized egg is is the actual thing like the actual life force that's within that embryo is kind of it's the sacrifice that you're making of this egg giving giving this beautiful pesimka back to the world um so that's what it's all, that's kind of what the inside keeping the inside in there is all about i'm just going to show you a couple more um onion ones because that was the one i showed you that was overnight in the yellow skin onion dye that i had just made yesterday and I actually had an old onion skin dye. I'm pretty sure I made a bunch of these around family day weekend, which in Ontario is in February. And they're still good, which I was going to tell you that most dyes only last a few days. <laughs> um, but this is like a miracle of dyes. I'm actually grateful that they've kept so long for this workshop. Um, but not sure. I did keep them cool. And I did filter out the actual dye stuffs. Um, but they kind of were in different changing temperatures. I put them in my car, I took them inside, I put them in my house and I don't know, kind of cool. So this is the color I got um, last night when I put my, this was just a light green egg in the onion skin overnight. This is what I pulled out this morning. Very, very beautiful. It might not show fully on the computer screen. Really beautiful, deep, rich, orangey red. Um, I'm not sure if it's red onion skin. I think it is. I can. I didn't label whether it was red or yellow onion skin. I do use both, but you can see that the saturation is really great. No vinegar and nothing. Just onion skin. So onion skins are really the strongest. Um, uh, yeah, I live in the country. Uh, we have a well. It's pretty iron rich. Um, very hard water, and I use that water. I didn't let it sit. I didn't do anything special to it. You can certainly try playing with distilled water and or let the water just sit if you're in the city. Um, you could buy water. I mean, don't buy water. That seems silly. I don't think it makes 
it does make a difference. Everything makes a difference, but just work with what you have and you'll get the results that work for you. They're not going to be bad. They'll just be different. So the thing is that it will always just be what it is. And um, if it's really not working, you're just not getting any colors, then by all means, try something else. But if you can just use what you have, I think that's my approach. That's like, um, that's, I think that's what I'm going to suggest. Um, There's some questions. Humidifier, water works. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much the chlorine affects these dyes. Um, what I imagine it would do, it, it would kind of brighten them maybe. Um, I don't think it would affect the dye. Like, I don't think it would make it less effective. I just don't know enough about the chemistry so i could be just making up a bunch of crap but i've also made natural dyes when i lived in the city in toronto um i never used special water i think i might have left the water in a glass jar overnight to just let it sit because i was thinking about that but i'm not sure that it made a big difference yeah bojana can you clarify about the length of uh the dye uh shelf life versus the actual pesinka dyed with natural egg shelf life I think it might be a, um, mm. just to clarify: Do we keep them for a long time? Do we not keep them for a long time? The dyes, mm. I think, is 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 um, yeah. The dyes, yeah. yeah. So that's the main thing. And if there's, and I was thinking about what is like the main thing that we need to talk about today, um, or the main like takeaway, or whatever you want to call it, the the lesson. Uh, yeah, I see the question there about color fading. Is that um, we're talking about making pisimke? I'm talking about making pisimke traditionally. Pesimke are made during the Lenten period, during the pre-spring uh, celebration period, and they're used for Easter or for spring, whichever religion you follow. And they're given, like, that's it. That's the purpose of them. They're not an art artifact. And if you want to make art artifacts, this also can work. Um, but for me, that's kind of what I'm talking about. So just to put ourselves in a different mindset of like, this is how it works to work with natural materials. Yes, they can last, and maybe I'm shooting myself in the foot here, but this is just, I feel very strongly about it. So um, if we have an, a full egg, it might not have a long shelf life because we might go and we might say a prayer with it and leave it at the grave, you know, when we go there for Zelani Skatha as an offering, or we might, I might go put it in my garden as I do the, my first sowing of my food for the summer um i might give it away to somebody and they'll keep it and then they move and they have to give it away and they're going to feel so bad oh but actually they can just put it in the garden and not feel bad because you're not poisoning the earth you're not told you have to keep this forever and it's just a letting go so i guess i kind of want to encourage people to maybe ponder that and reflect upon that for a while because that's actually how everything is if we're embroidering something that textile is not going to last forever unless we put it in the museum if we wear it and wash it and wear it it will eventually wear out and that's just how life works so um even the color fastness of our threads if we use natural dyes do they need to last forever no because that shirt's not going to last forever so that's my spiel about that. But that being said, um, yeah, they are color fast and uh, it varies. So like anything, it varies very much. Um, I have found that uh, the turmeric fades a lot in the sun. If you have your pissing can a bright room and they're on display all year, let's say, like maybe you don't just put them out for Easter, but you have them out all the time in a sunny spot fades cochineal doesn't fade hardly at all i've had almost no fading it's really done amazingly some of these have been traveling a lot and in sunny spots for a while you can see that um it's another one just white and cochineal we're going to talk about cochineal in a second i haven't talked about it yet um i found i find the onion doesn't fade that much this is like great so those copper and lines are onion this is from probably six years ago and the dark color is purple cabbage. It was a black. It's faded slightly, maybe, to like a midnight blue. Um, but it's traveled a lot. It's been handled a lot. So you can see those colors are quite good. So the colors do stay. Um, I have red. OK, here's one I made a couple of months ago. That's matter. So the onion is kind of the orangey color. And then the red background is matter, matter root, which I'm going to talk about as well. Um, that's not been in the sun. And there's like an old one. Actually, this might just be two years old or three years old. Um, that's cochineal, that purple. It's kind of this color. Oh, it's a little bit more purple. And um, I think onion. 
yeah. So they don't necessarily fade more. Um, I would say turmeric fades, uh, and I'm not sure about safflower, maybe the lighter colors, but I find the darker ones are just as good. Here's a uh, cabbage, two tones of purple cabbage, just in one Kukuban Pesimka that I carry everywhere, even though it's so broken. <laughs> it's so gorgeous. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that about the fading question. Now, um, if you want to make them to sell or to display, I suppose you could just varnish them and that would probably solve that problem quite well. If you're interested in like a lot of the nuances, I did send a link to Mariana Svarnik's blog. She's um, got some pretty good uh, observations about some particular dyes rub off a little bit if you rub them. So she has some recommendations of some dyes that don't do that and that you can over dye on top with those to finish off the pesimka. Um, if you're interested in doing some kind of rubbing or etching where you, it requires rubbing, or if maybe you're going to rub varnish on it, or you probably wouldn't you just spray varnish. Um, but she's got some more information about that on her blog and her blog is excellent. Please, please, please. If you're seriously going to get into this and you're interested, just um, take an extensive look at her research because she's done a great job. Um, I don't use varnish. I can't answer that question. I don't know. Uh, there's probably lots of people here that use varnish and could say, but I've been told that spray varnish would obviously be the easiest. Just stick your egg on a skewer and spray it. Um, or sometimes the people have those nail pegboards that you can use. Um, please do that outside. None of these things are good for you. Not good for anybody. So that's why I don't use them. But I'm sure they've made them less harmful than they used to be. Um, yeah, like if you empty your pisanka, you can put it on a wire or a skewer and then just spray varnish. Um, my mother used to varnish with gloves on with her hands. Um, yep, the blog and all that stuff was in the email. So if you didn't get it, uh, we'll send that to you later. Um, okay, so let me kind of talk a little bit more about some of the other colors that I've used. Let's see how our um, safflower egg is doing in here. Oh, it's actually doing pretty well. I don't know if you can see that at all. I just see white, but it's turned yellow. Great, that was not a very long time. So as you can see, that doesn't take too long. It was a green base and it's still even over dyed over the green. So can you, Adrian, um, look, can you lift that up to your left? There we go, a little bit better, thank you. Can you see you. it? Yep. Yeah, is it yellow? Looks yellow to me. Okay, but a halo, awesome. but it's yellow. Okay. Um, and you can see like the, the dye itself kind of looks orangey red. Um, so the color of this is not necessarily going to translate exactly to the color you get. And the petals, well, you know, like saffron. So the petals were actually quite dark. Is that better? Oh, that's a bit better. So they're kind of orange. Um, so I had, this was the, um, the ground saffron American moulu. Moulu? Moulu? Okay, so that's safflower. That gives us a nice yellow. Oh, and what's really nice about these, of course, if you're using um, chemical dyes, you really have to be careful about handling them. You don't want to absorb them in your skin. You don't want to breathe them in. Um, they can stain your clothes. This is just so much less intense. I can not worry so much about, um, yeah. It, it doesn't rub off as, mm, how to explain it? Um, so it really just adheres to the eggshell and there is no, well, the liquid that comes off isn't so staining. So we don't have to worry as much about, like we can reuse almost the same paper towel for each color. Okay, so that's yellow. Let me um, try another one. So I've got next, so I talked about the onions. Next I'd go into yellow onion, then I could do red onion skin. Um, I don't have lights. It's all natural sunlight. That's what's so great. <laughs> It's so white right now. <laughs> I've like covered every window. Um, uh, here I have, okay. Here I've got, this is what I used last night to get that orange that I showed you. So we're gonna skip that. I'm gonna go to matter, matter root. It's almost the same color as my safflower mix. I used powder this time, but those that ordered kits, I gave you um, root. I really like the chop root a lot better. Yeah, exactly. Purple onion skin, yeah. So all year long, save, save your onion skin. That humming is back. Oh no. 
maybe it's just the computer. Okay, should I try um try doing something? Nope, that's good. Now it's gone. Okay, so that's the matter uh, root powdered. I just made this a few hours ago, and I've never used the powder before, so we'll see what happens. But I have used the chopped up root, which um, has given me wonderful results, and that's why I recommend it really um, highly. That's the red matter. This is probably overnight to get that rich color. What we can also do to get darker colors is we can um, over dye. So we can take this out, dry it, put it back in. Just do multiple layers, multiple uh, uh, um, yeah, dye bats, dye bats, that's the word. Um, matter, it grows in warmer countries. So it, it was the color that's so famous in like Persian rugs. So when you see that gorgeous, gorgeous red, that deep red, and it was traded. So people in Ukraine would have used it. Um, I don't think they use it so much anymore. I, I'm not sure if anyone's reviving that in the Kilim tradition and the Karpata, but uh, it is readily available and it is exotic and it comes from far away, but I think it's uh, great to still be able to support people who um are growing this like you know it's actually a farm industry for our dyes rather than an industrial industry um you can grow it in north america i'm in zone like zone three are we in zone three we're like pretty cold actually where we are in our micro zone and we can grow it in the summer in if we started indoors we can get it going and we get can get enough to um dig it out in the fall and have something for dyeing but the reason why um most people buy matter is it's really really hard to dig out <laughs> it has all these tiny tiny little roots yeah i'm i'm probably zone edge of zone four zone three yeah so those of you in um, toronto or further south are really lucky you can grow a lot of things but still i mean it this would not last through the winter you just have a longer growing season for it but matter has these little roots that are really um, hard to then locate and dig them all up. And then you'd have to rinse them and sift them and dry them and chop them up. So it's a lot of labor. Um, you can try it, it's, it's great fun. And yeah, you can buy the seeds online because it's used widely in natural dyeing for fabric. It is available and there's a lot of information about it. Um, it's very popular. There is a lot of information for fabric. So when we talk about natural dyes for Pissum Kit, we have a very different um, material we're working with, right? So protein, eggshell base, fabric. I mean, there are, pro of course. So dyes work better on proteins. Like that's why wool dyes better than cotton or linen. And um, for fabric, we have protein and like silk as well uh, and plant matters mixed. But the difference is that with fabric dyeing, we get to, we get to um, boil, right? We boil the fabric with the dye or often it's um, pre-treated that way, but we can't do that with the eggs. And so we have to have a, a cold steep. Even though we might create the dyes with heat, um, the eggs are gonna have to be in there in a cold state. And there's not much we can do to get around that. So it's, we're just working with a kind of a different uh, different circumstances. So with all of these dyes, again, if I added mat, um, sorry, alum, with all of these dyes, if I add a modifier, I can change the range of possibilities, getting different tones. So I could get a brighter, more pinkish color if I add alum. Then with the matter just on its own, probably more of an orangey red. And then if I want a deeper red, um, what Mariana has done and what I'm going to suggest too is that you can mix it a bit with the cochineal which is more on the purpley pink range to get more of a berry red and she does 50 50. Um, I haven't done that myself yet but I, I'm going to try that this year because I think that's a great recommendation to combine those colors. Now with matter uh, you don't want to boil it because you can destroy um, its ability to die so you just want to Put the matter in the cool water and bring it up to almost a simmer and turn it off and let it sit and steep that way. Today I just try just pouring um, boiling water into, into the jar right away just to make it easy for myself. So you can see it's already taking on a light pink color. Maybe you can see that. Um, 
depending on how much dye stuff I've put into this, I'll get a lighter or darker color, depending on the modifier, depending on my water, depending on my eggshell, all those things. But um, if you're only dyeing a few eggs, try and conserve the expensive dye stuffs and just put a like make it concentrated and put less water. Um, if you're only dyeing one egg or two eggs at a time, you only need as much liquid as will cover those eggs, right? Now, one thing to talk about is exhausting the dyes. So of course, they will get used up in a different way than the aniline dyes do. So they kind of have their life force in a way, if you want to think about it energetically. And after a while, it's just used up. So it might still look like it's colorful or colored. Um, but it might just not really take anymore, but you can just keep using this until it just doesn't give you the results that you want anymore. And even let's say if it's only dying pale pink now, I might save this and use it for pale pink. And I might use it just to dye on white eggs that I want to start with a light pink. Now, if I want it as a deep red on top of like a yellow or orange, then that won't be useful to me anymore. But I think, um, uh, it's all doable. You're just going to be in a, just don't compare anything to aniline dyeing. Just pay attention to what's happening. Work with what you have and um, it will work. It will, it will do well and it will work. Um, yeah. So just some things that you need to know about the plant itself, like matter doesn't like being boiled. Um, when I use the uh, chopped up roots. I've made lots of krashenke with them and I think I just used like way more than I needed to and I had a very strong dye. I was able to sift out. I just poured them through a sieve and the dry roots were left on the sieve and I discovered that when they dried out I could actually use them again. So if I um, use a lot and I haven't tired it out um, then I won't uh, have a problem getting more color out of them. Like I think their roots have a lot more and generally we know like the spices when things are ground they lose their everything kind of loses its um, potency when it's ground much quicker. So when we have things more in their natural form and dry, they'll keep longer. So it's nice to work with those big chunks of roots um, or flower petals and keep them as long as you can or even not grind them at all. Um, I have not, have I tried indigo? I'm not sure, I don't think it works. Um, haven't even gone there. I um, live with some pretty amazing natural dye people who dye fabric and uh, my neighbor grows indigo. And I don't know how much anybody knows about indigo, but it is um, a huge undertaking. It's like a really committed process and it's very finicky. It's very beautiful. Um, It's uh, all about fermentation. So I don't think that, yeah. And, and anyway, there's a lot to say about indigo. So if you don't know about indigo, you can research it, but it takes um, very specific conditions and it's about heating the vat, having it hot, the fabric and the indigo react to oxygen. So I don't think that it would work for eggs. And I don't think we need to try because we get a gorgeous blue from purple cabbage. And purple cabbage is cabbage. The Koreans have cabbage. We all have cabbage. It's great for the Northern climate that we live in. And it's so accessible. It's so cheap. It's so easy. You can eat the rest of the cabbage. So yeah, I, I don't think um, it makes sense to try indigo, but if anybody does and gets some kind of mysterious results, uh, please share. That would be really interesting. But yeah, I'm very, very interested in indigo. Indigo is one of my favorite colors. I love it on fabric. It's gorgeous. I know lots of people that have married themselves to it. And it's really like a spiritual practice. And it's its own thing. When somebody's doing like an indigo vat, it's a whole other world. It's very cool. If you don't know, you can watch. There's amazing little documentaries about the indigo tradition in Japan, which has been preserved against all odds, actually, through war and lots of different things. And it's very, very beautiful. And God bless those people keeping indigo alive. But yeah, I don't, I don't think it will work for Pacific. <laughs> um, but let's talk about purple cabbage. So uh, sorry, Bojana, one more question. In terms of keeping your, in terms of keeping your uh, dyes cool, do you keep them refrigerated or in a cool place, like in a basement? What was your recommendation yeah. on that one? 
Well, the basement is a fridge, it depends, right? Just cool. I don't know. They won't last that long. Um, you can't keep them from year to year. Yeah. So I just happen to have to do, I did, we did this natural dye video in February. So I, I happened to want to keep them. I didn't want to waste them. I didn't actually get a chance to make this again. I put them in a cool, like my floor is actually quite cool in my house. So um generally that doesn't work so well but yeah a fridge a fridge but you, you cannot keep them from year to year that's for sure yeah so i should speak more about that but i feel like doing that a little bit later um yeah so okay so we had the pinks the reds the yellows um i should mention i mentioned bark apple bark and pear bark i have used it's i i use the inner bark so when you peel the outer bark of a twig, like right now it's apple tree pruning time. If you have all your prunings, you can just cut off the outer bark and all the inner bark um, will be gorgeous, like bright green. I got, uh, I added vinegar or alum and I got a gorgeous pink from the pear bark. So pretty. And some of the, I think the photo for this event has an egg with pink and blue and that pink was from pear bark. So that's a really fun one to experiment with. Most of us have some fruit trees around. There might be other plants that have um, interesting barks. Mm, you know, whatever you have at, under, you know, around in your neighborhood. Um, yeah, so purple cabbage uh, gives a lot of pigment and people use it a lot for blue. This has a light blue and a dark blue, and it dies quite quickly. So maybe we'll do um, a white egg and blue to show you. This is the one I made in February that still worked last night. Actually, I should show you. This is getting into the dark colors, but I had just started a pistol gun aniline dye during work. And that had red aniline dye underneath and I put it in this from February, <laughs> this very concentrated blue cabbage, purple cabbage dye. And this is the color I got overnight, no vinegar, nothing. It's pretty amazing. It's almost black. You could call it black. Probably when it's all done, the contrast will seem like red and black. Again, colors are all relational, right? So what we see is what combination of colors we have. Um, so that's, um, oh yeah, alder. Yeah, alder is definitely mentioned a lot. I haven't done that yet and I would like to. So alder is definitely also very much in Northern Ukraine and in swampy lands, uh, a traditional dye. It's certainly used for fabric for sure. I have two different ones here. So I just made one, but it didn't cool before I got here. So I didn't, didn't take out the cabbage. But you can see, so I actually just pack the jar really full just because there's so much um available it's so easy so i do that i make it really concentrated i don't think you have to do that or you could just pack it this full and just just make sure it's submerged and um, mariana boils hers i used to do that i think you get just as good a result yeah just steeping i just poured boiling water over it last year in my classroom with nine-year-olds which was amazing we made all these dyes by just putting all the dye stuffs in jars filling with like lukewarm water and putting them in a sunny window so that the children could observe over the day how the dyes developed and we didn't boil or cook or use hot like we didn't yeah we didn't use boiling water I haven't talked about elderberry no she was talking about alder and all of these dyes steeped to the same concentration and the same effectiveness without boiling and um, I have a photo of like all the eggs lined up Kind of in the long basket. I don't know if that was posted in the event, but the colors were phenomenal. It was awesome. And we didn't add any modifiers, I don't think. We didn't do anything really. So you can get really great results like that. Um, you probably won't make all the dyes at once like we did. Yeah, without getting into that. I'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, so this is purple cabbage and once this is done steeping, I'll give it a little bit of time. I see the liquid has gotten really dark. I'll remove the cabbage leaves, compost them or whatever, feed them to the animals, and um, I'll have this, this liquid left. If uh, So it will smell like cabbage starts to smell cabbagey, right? So this is a stinky one. This one actually, I think what happened is it, it somehow got preserved 
I'm not even sure. I don't remember adding anything, but let's say like if anyone makes kraut, you just add salt and then it will ferment. If it gets the right um, equilibrium of bacteria, it will ferment into a delicious brew. So uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be disgusting and stinky. Um, the salt would change the dye, um, but I don't think I did that, but this one seems to actually smell good <laughs> like sauerkraut. So, you know, you'll find out. You'll, I don't know what happened. Maybe I had already some sauerkraut culture left in this jar. <laughs> I have a lot of kraut in my house. So maybe it was just in the air. It's kept uh, really well because some usually you would have some mold form on the top, right? Um, this is quite unusual. But I did, I did have it cool. So if you have mold and it starts to just look weird and your dyes just start losing color, they're just done. It's time to compost. Um, and all natural things um, can go weird and wonky and grow really weird molds. I had some really weird molds. <laughs> some of the other ones that I've dumped, the matter doesn't keep very long. Um, yeah, anyway, we don't need to talk about the weird cultures that are happening in my house. But uh, I want to dip this one in for you to see what we get. Oh, hi, Dina. Oh. Yeah, I haven't done much with bark dyes. What was your question? Sumac, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would boil barks. Yeah, uh, generally. For like decoctions and things you want to boil barks. I don't remember what I did with the pear bark. I probably simmered it. Yeah. Um, yeah. The only exception, well, and then like roots, the exception is matter. You don't want to boil matter. So your intuition would say, oh, it's a root like thing. It's hard. I want to boil it, but with matter, you don't want to do that. Um, sumac is used for dye. It's actually used more for the tannic component and that's something Olenka Klaban um, talks more about and did more research about. It doesn't work so great as a dye. I actually didn't bring the book I wanted to show you but there is a lady in Ukraine, Irina Mikhail Mikhailovich. She's in central Ukraine. I'm not sure if it's um, left bank and she's put out a book. It's available at Kuta Uma. I'm really sorry, I don't remember the title right now. I think I put it in the email, put it in the email that everybody got, I was gonna show you. She's done a lot, a lot, a lot of um, experimentation as well and just got amazing results. I don't always get the results she does. So I stick with what works for me and I stick with the easy things because I feel like I get the range of colors that's good enough for me. Um, yeah. So she doesn't actually even emphasize that she's using natural dyes as much in a way like it's um, more that she's just, um, I mean, she does her book, her book is all um, photographs of the materials, so the dyes stuffs and then the results in her pism kit. Um, but her blog and her website, they're just about the spiritual connection that this practice gives. And she does lots of workshops in Ukraine, even right now through the war, she's posting videos to kind of keep everybody's morale up. She's amazing. So she's put out that book. You can support her. You can buy it from Kota Uma in Toronto. They, of course, ship. They have a website. Um, I've really been grateful for her. She has a Facebook page for her updates and her posts. Um, I'm pretty sure she's done like everything out there. But what I found, I guess this is my particular, everybody has their thing, my particular, I don't know, thing is that I'm trying to use mostly what's just like available in my kitchen other than the matter and the cut, you know, I cheat, but I already had those because I do some textile stuff. Um, and some of the things that she's using are not even blooming or available in Canada for another two months. Like she's like, oh, now it's time to die with birch catkins. They're blooming and coltsfoot and this and that. I'm like, oh, not where I live. Like that's not going to be for another month and a half. So yeah, check out her book. But I guess for me, that's just why I haven't been doing that. I'm not going to write Piss and Kit in May or June. Um, she does recommend freezing or Mariana talks about that. So you can freeze some of those materials. I don't even have a freezer where I live and I'm just not, yeah, 
I guess I'm just not interested in doing that. I just kind of want to use things that are easy and at hand. But certainly if you want to use elderberries, somebody mentioned elderberries, um, really strong dyes, pokeberry, blueberries. I haven't mentioned blueberries. Blueberries are great. Uh, you might have them frozen. Those are great to use. Um, I have tried them. You know, blueberries are kind of more of a gray blue, so I'm not that interested in it. But um, I don't know if Angela is on here today. Angela, your um, blueberry dye really inspired me. So Angela used uh, pure wild blueberry juice, that like really concentrated juice that she just purchased. And she got an amazing color overnight. Yeah, right, it was almost black. So I, I think that would be a good way to go for black as well. I'm not sure how much it rubs off. Um, but I like I had frozen blueberries and I cooked them or whatever, and I didn't get as good of a result. So I think the concentrated juice, oh, a couple of days, there you go. <laughs> the concentrated juice is a good way to go. And she says she left it for a couple of days. So you can see like the timing is so different for each dye. And then for the um, intensity of your dyes, how long you leave things in. And there's no, there's no formula. So you just, you just go and you like, look, right? People are always like, how long do I leave it in there? I'm like, I don't know. Just take it out and see what you've gotten. Um, so what, that's been like 10 minutes and that's a light, kind of a light purplish blue. It's hardly anything, but it will, it'll take, um, you won't give it an hour or two. And you're not sitting and making piss and okay, waiting for all this to happen. You're just going on and doing other things in your life. And then you come back and you see, okay, okay, cool. That's done. That's about where I want it. And you take it out. And then if you want to work on it, you can then, or you just come back in the evening and work on it. Or the, the easiest rhythm that I found is you just um, put them in overnight and come in the morning. Actually, it's so fun. It's like Christmas every morning. You wake up, you go see what colors you got. <laughs> um, you go in the morning and take them all out and then you can work on them further that evening. So my recommendation. Um, yeah, yeah, those aren't, those things that, so somebody just wrote in the chat about natural dyes, First Nations arts crafts. I've looked at that too, like what um, First Nations were using to dye porcupine quills, cause that's protein. Um, that's what they would have traditionally been embroidering with before there were commercially dyed beads and uh, threads. Um, please experiment and let me know what you get. I, I, I think some of those, again, they rely on heat. So um, not necessarily going to translate to what we can get, um, but certainly some of those, yeah, some of the, the blue, the blossoms um, and the barks, but the barks might just, some barks just give like these dark browns. So I don't know how much you want that for your pistol kit designs. Um, here's a brown one that Olenka Kleban made. I believe that's black walnut. It's very pretty. I could be wrong, could be tea mixed or could have been black walnut. Black walnut needs iron modifier to really get it dark, but it never really gets black. It's just this rich dark brown. Um, but of course it's very pretty just with a white egg. And her hand is of course steady and gorgeous. Um, so black walnut is another option. I've made ink and paint and it's great, but I just didn't like it so much for this ink here. It's kind of oily. Um, yeah, I don't know. Variable. Yeah, you don't make piss and goats out of spring, unless you're a piss and artist and you sell them and you make them all year. That's kind of, yeah, but piss and of course, it's a spring, it's a spring uh, ritual. Yeah, that color is beautiful. So brown is great. And of course, if you want to make Trapillion style, um, piss and you might want some deep. Uh, I found what's really nice is these, these deep uh, onion tones with with brown tones that would give you Tripillion, like the colors that mimic the pottery of Tripillion culture. Um, okay, one more dye I haven't talked about that I made and that you have in your kits if you ordered the kits. And that is kind of my favorite one. Well, I know it's fun to talk about. That's cochineal. So I sent the whole, you got the whole, um, bugs, I guess, the insects in their entirety. They're not ground up, they're not crushed up. These are the tiny little dried up larva, kind of little bodies of the beetles that uh, feed on cacti. 
So they are like parasites and cacti. And they're very well known, cochinilla, around the world for their color because it is fabulous. Um, you might not get the intensity you would on fabric with um, eggs, but if you look up cochineal on fabric, it's like just stunning fuchsia, fuchsia, purple, pink, red. You can get so many tones out of this color and you don't need very much. It's very, very concentrated. So you might just use like a tiny little, tiny little teaspoon of that. If you grind it up, I think you might be able to get more out of it, but I just keep it whole because it's easier to filter out um, and it goes a long way. So, and again, to conserve it is expensive. It's coming from far away to conserve it. I just make a little bit of liquid and make it very concentrated. Um, and if you add alum to that one, you'll get more of the pinkish tones rather than the bluish tones. I did show you some that I made uh, a while back and they're quite um, purplish, purplish pink. Um, so the bugs are still in here. The liquid looks like just, you can't, oh, it just looks like bare. It looks like cherry red. It's so pretty. Let's put a white egg in there and see what we get. Switch the to put a green egg. Let's see, so again, we can also play with the colors, the natural colors of the eggshells. Using brown, light brown eggs is great if you wanna get richer colors. Um, and sometimes, if you've drawn lines on the brown eggshell with all your different colors in the end, it won't even look brown. It just in the in the um, contrast with the other colors, it will just look kind of beigey. Yeah, I didn't I didn't grind them. I just soaked them whole. You can. I just haven't. I don't like the powdery things. They, it's, it's not true. Seems like a pain, but you totally can. I, I yeah, don't listen to me. <laughs> and you can just filter, you can just filter it out after. Um, so it's taking okay, I should show you this. It's taking the color right away. It's very strong. I haven't added anything. You can see that. So it's just like instant, but we'll leave it in there for a while. And the most important thing to remember is that unless you're just doing one pattern like two tone, two color pisimke, all of these colors will depend on the color that came before and their relationship with each other and how they're covering each other, like how they're overlaying. Um, and that's where you get, that's where you get the density and the richness uh, build up. And that's how you're able to get like a black by the time you're putting a dark blue on. All right, that's a lot of talking all at once. Um, there are a few key things I wanted to mention while I have my list open. One thing is keep a notebook. <laughs> That's my advice. Um, oh, here it is. Keep a notebook for recording and keeping track of your experiments. If you are delving into this, it's really hard to keep track. Um, and here I have some notes from 2019. Maybe I should have checked them before I talked to you. So here I have pear bark. Yes, I boiled it a few minutes, okay? I used it fresh. So one thing that's gonna change things is whether something's fresh or dried, whether you just steeped it or whether you boiled it. Um, sometimes things wanna be pre-steeped before they're heated up. Um, cold steep often draws things out differently. We all know about cold coffee now. Um, Fresh onion skins. I also um, added boiling water, but no vinegar. Uh, something that Olenka Kleban discovered is that adding a pinch of alum. Oh, I actually saw this also somewhere when talking about fabric. When adding a pinch of alum to red onion skins, you can get a green. So it just totally transforms. It's so cool when you have it and you just add the alum in, you see it change. It goes into this green tone. Um, I didn't find like that turned out like very dark or pronounced. Maybe if I had done it on a white egg, but as I was layering, I didn't get such a great result. So I haven't really played with it, but it is something you can do. Yeah. And you can get also a green from stinging nettle, which is in our, in our neck of the woods, our climate is just starting to come up. So the young fresh leaves are so great for green. They're so potent. 
I tried working with dried nettle, which I have a lot of, um, which you would just have like dried nettle bulk herbs or from like for tea in the winter. Um, it does work. It, it works pretty well overnight. It's still very pale and it's a kind of a darker foresty green, which I don't think looks so nice with my Pasoka designs, so I don't use it, but you can use it. And I think it would look really nice with just white and green or maybe green and blue. Um, yep, so yeah, just keep a notebook, keep records of things. Um, maybe if you're trying to be consistent year to year, you would um, measure how much dye. Uh, I tried spinach, yeah, I don't know why I didn't get anything. Apparently it is supposed to be very good and I didn't try again. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know, some emails bounce back. So if your email didn't work, then it might not have worked. We'll figure that out. Um, yeah, so spinach is, uh, uh, I think, supposed to be very good. I didn't um, experiment further because I'm not that interested in green. But uh, you could also purchase dried spinach powder, which might be a better. And there are a lot, because of um, a rise in these fancy food things, colored smoothies and all sorts of colored desserts. Uh, these days, I have found that you can order a lot of powdered natural food coloring things. I'm not sure that they would all work on Pisumke, but so there's like, you can actually purchase ground um, spinach, ground purple cabbage. Um, there's something called anato seed. It's also tropical which basically would give you the same effect as this onion skin. So I don't see a purpose in buying something exotic if I can get the exact same color, but you could buy that in a powder. So if you want to experiment with powders, or if you just want to color some fancy desserts, that's like what's available for people in the um, catering and like restaurant industry. Avocado pits, yep, is also popular. And um, uh, it's the one that's made out of like the seaweed Spirulina. Spirulina, if anybody is like a vegan and they're into spirulina, you know it stains. It's like so, so intense. It's very dark green. It's almost like an emerald green. And um, I haven't tried it. I think it would work, but it's very powdery. It's sort of like turmeric. So you might get a stain, but if you try rubbing um, the wax off at the end or like you want at the end process, you might find that some of that is coming off. Um, there are ways to deal with that. And I kind of mentioned that with the over dyeing of something that seals that, but that's one of the issues. That's one of the issues that comes up with natural dyes that might not come up with your aniline dye process. Yes, freeze dried fruits. Yep. Yep. That could work for sure. Okay. Avocado pits. Very, 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 very trendy right now and popular. You kind of this color or a lighter pink like a salmon and it's used for fabric. So I was curious to try it and I never buy avocados but somebody threw some out, some pits, so I took them. And yep, I got a really nice salmon-y, um, kind of a very beigey pink. I just find it so bland. It's so like blah. But I think I didn't make it very concentrated. So absolutely you can experiment with that. And I'm pretty sure there's a, something you need to know about whether it works dried or if you have to, I think you have to keep the avocado skins and pit fresh. So you'd have to freeze them if you're not ready to use them right away, if you don't have enough um, quantity. Mm -hmm. So elderberry, somebody mentioned elderberry. Irena Mikhailevich that I mentioned in Ukraine, she's gotten amazing results. She uses elderberry a lot. She gets a really dark color. Again, I think like the blueberry, you'd probably be better off buying some really concentrated elderberry juice to use that rather than just trying to do it with the berries. I tried with some berries. I didn't have a great result and I didn't try again um, because cabbage. I can get everything from cabbage. So yeah, you could use fruit. Uh, there's also a pokeberry, which is a poisonous fruit, but is uh, amazing for dying. Uh, which grows in southern Ontario and across North America. So you could, if you see some, if you find some, or if you could locate that. Um, blueberry, yeah. Wild blueberry. With the cultivated blueberries won't have enough pigment. Yeah, aronia, exactly. We're talking about aronia in the summer. I, I bet that would work. 
I bet that would work well if you have some, right? If you can find it. I think the juice, I think the concentrated juice, which you can definitely find in Balkan and like Eastern European grocery stores. It's very popular, concentrated. Um, it's very, very tart. Has a lot of them. Oh my gosh, wow, okay. Wow, that was like really instant. Okay, I did not use a lot of cochineal at all. So I think the key is to use very little water. And uh, I don't know, it's awesome. That's great. There you go. So it doesn't necessarily have to take so long. It depends on which dye you're using. Some of these dyes are much more, uh, much stronger and much more concentrated. That's the cochineal. So that's the, um, and this is literally from a farm I visited in Oaxaca. Angela has been there too, actually. They're amazing. They're keeping the the um, traditional practices of growing cochineal on these cacti alive. So it's a small family business. So it's really great that we're supporting them as well when we use these. Um, it's all done just, you know, naturally, they just grow these cacti, then they put the bugs on them, then they collect the bugs and dry them. So it's pretty amazing. And they're now supplying the textile industry in Oaxaca. That's, there's a revival in natural dyeing of fabrics and their traditional rugs and yarns. So it's just supporting those people. Basically, this was the dye that was so common everywhere in the world. And um, it just, it just because of the economy, it got, it got um, close to extinction, which is a story also similar to indigo. That's why a lot of people are very passionate about reviving indigo. Because red commercial dye was so, so, so easy to achieve and so cheap, but it's also very toxic. And um, so cochineal was kind of kept alive, I think, because it was used in food colorings, which vegans have an issue with, but um, uh, it's gaining more revival because of the fabric, the interest in, um, yeah, just a more environmentally respectful uh, textile practices. Somebody asked about red wine. Yeah, I think it does work. Yeah, red wine definitely stains, right? So uh, try that, maybe more of a fortified wine or maybe cook it down so it's more concentrated I don't know but I, I'm not sure you'd get like a red or how much of a burgundy it might just turn out very dark kind of um almost purplish yeah try it I think so I think I've seen people use it I'm not sure I think again with the, it's all about the layering so what you get underneath uh, will affect what you're able to achieve if you're looking for dark saturated colors all right what else can I tell you? The main thing is that the things that affect these dyes are um, all the materials we're using, right? So the eggs, the, the, the components of the eggshell. So please try and source eggs from a farm, from somebody that's actually raising their chickens, eating natural things, uh, free ranging, running around, being healthy, eating minerals that are in the soil rather than some weird food they're getting. Those shells will take the dye much, much better they will be stronger, it's better for the world, um, for all, all the things. Um, yeah, coffee and wine, absolutely. Um, then the water you're using, but I'm not sure what I can tell you about the actual results, but just that it will obviously impact the dye. There's my head not cut off. And the, the pH, of the, uh, pH of everything. So, the, the acidity will make dyes brighter. Um, you might want to play around with some like basic things. Um, some people do add like baking soda or um, the, the Tums, the anti-acid uh, things. You can just crush up the Tums and put them in. So I'm not sure what colors you'd use those for to try and achieve some results, but you could just take one color and then see what you get when you add something as acidic or something base, basic. Um, and then of course the length of time. So the length of time I'm suggesting, like I just did this to show you, is very short for light colors, uh, sorry, for dark colors. And then for the light colors, if you want that range to, to be uh, deeper or lighter, that's what it's gonna depend on. Um, that's the red onion. So it's actually coming out of pink. That's very cool. So this is probably an hour now or 40 minutes. And overnight it was this. 
So it's all about time and it's all about your rhythm. So it's just a different approach to writing Pismica. So traditionally it would only be done for this kind of short time leading up to you know, the, the end of winter, early spring. And so you should make the dye when you're prepared to work with it and then you finish using it and it's over and the season is over, the some care done, that's it. You can't keep them. Usually they'll go, they'll spoil in a few days or they'll just lose their intensity. But as I mentioned, mine didn't, so I don't know, <laughs> it's kind of depends. But yeah, so that's just um, one thing that I did read and I found this to be true from my own experience. Now I've very much absorbed this is that in Ukraine traditionally, um, there's a wonderful book that actually the women write about this. You'd sit and you'd probably just work on a few eggs and you'd do all your base layer that you want white or whatever eggshell color. And then you'd make your yellow dye and then you'd put them all in yellow. So they're all sitting in yellow, maybe overnight, whatever, like you're not waiting. You're just going and doing the rest of the things in your life. You're letting me sit, you take them out. Now you add all the yellow that you want in all of them. Now your yellow dye is done. You don't have to worry about it spoiling, whatever. It goes bad, you pour it out, whatever. Then you make your orange or red dye. Then you do all of that on all of them where you want the orange or red. And then, you know, then you make your dark, whatever other dyes, let's say purple or black, cabbage, blue, whatever. And then you let those sit overnight, you get them all and they're all done. And then you, and then you clean them all at the end. You, you, you finish them all at the end at the same time, like in a batch. So you're basically working in batches. And I think that actually that's very, very true. And I think it's what makes the most sense with this process. Um, it's just what happens when you're doing it. Like it just is actually what flows. So it's about this flow. It's about a different approach to it. It's kind of how life is when you're homesteading and farming. Everything is just done when the time, like, yeah, it all kind of fits. Like, so yes, it takes uh, an hour to me, for me to get the wood chopped and the stove going and my water boiling and everything cooked, but I'm not sitting there waiting. Like while the fire is starting and the stove is heating up, I'm going and chopping up my food to get it ready for cooking. And by the time I'm done, my stove is hot. Now I can cook my food and now um, I can turn it all down. It cools down. I walk away. I don't have to worry about it. The house gets warmed up. Like it's all kind of everything is just part of the flow. And then I'm ready to sit down and make my pislink in the evening. I've had my dye steeping maybe while my stove was cooling and all the food was whatever. Like it's slower, but not necessarily. You're always on the go, but it's just that you are planning in advance and that you are um, doing things in batches and you're just like always planning as women and like anybody who's, you know, like kind of doing, being a, a homemaker, you know, of any, any kind, you're always planning, right? You're always planning your week, you're planning your days, you're planning your meals. So I think that that's kind of how the piss and kit making traditionally um, fits into all of that. So that's kind of my overall encouraging words to you how this is actually very accessible and it's not harder. It's not um, more, mis it's a bit more mysterious, but everything in life is a mystery, but it's not harder and it's not worse quality. It's not um, less color fast. It's not more like, yeah, I don't know. Um, and maybe you can't keep these dyes from year to year. So maybe in a way it's more expensive or more labor intensive but at the same time if you're using onion and cabbage and all these things it's actually not that expensive and it's part of already what's in your diet and it's maybe the leftovers from what you're already having part of your life um, and onion skins save them all year your avocado pits and things save them all year cabbage when you have an old cabbage and you just have to take off the outer leaves because they're not very nice anymore you just use those for dye and then you eat the inside that's my spiel. Excellent. Uh, can we take questions now, Bojana? 
feel like I just talked for two hours straight. Holy <laughs> God, I, think I could say that much about this. Okay. I think I think also the the idea of you know the flow that you're saying it's it's a meditative process, right? Like the the pisanka is a spiritual meditation. It is a yeah. talisman that protects the earth. It's kind of a renewal of um, you know kind of blessing the renewal of the earth and all that. And so when you're doing the meditative process, it's like while the stove is boiling, while this is all this a thing is going on all at once you finally have the time at the end of the day to meditate, right? And it's kind of like, you know, and then after you've meditated in the evening, you put the egg back into another color and then you get to do the process again the next day. And you get to, it's almost like you're, you're praying over and over and over again. And that process is enjoyable rather than like, I gotta get this pisanka done. You know, like, it's not that same kind of like, let's get this egg done today. It's like, well, no, you're taking the time throughout the week or whatever, how long you want to make your pisanka for it gives you that opportunity to meditate over those days and the idea of spring coming and the renewal and the, the blessing of the earth. So it's really, yeah, I think yeah. that this process is a lot, makes a lot more sense instead of like, okay, I've prayed once all year and here it is. <laughs> like, here I mean, it it's, is. it's different also um, depending on again, like how many colors you want to work with yeah. and, and, and um, yeah, if you are ideological about like I was like, I just want to use what's local and, actually in season or whatever, or whether you are ordering in things from far away, whether you're just trying to use things you grew, whether you're just trying to use things that are edible, whether, you know, so there's just all these other kind of like factors if you want to. But I think I didn't, you know, speak about this, but if we're talking about traditionally in Ukraine, I mentioned a few things, but I'm going beyond that. I live in Canada. My reality is like, I have a choice. I can order things also from um, herbal supply places. So if uh, I don't find, I don't have a problem with that, actually. I think it's just our contemporary life. And I'd rather do that than buy chemicals, you know, even if they're made in Canada. I'm sorry, all you wonderful physical suppliers. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so the, the natural dyeing process, is also like you know yeah if you've got this that you know don't have all the colors right like if you want to you know in your in your kitchen you might only have three colors versus somebody that might be living in a different zone might have five right so yeah, it all depends on your process too so it's wonderful thank yeah, you so much yeah, and yeah, and uh and this is a wonderful process for us to kind of learn how you know there is this kind of almost a dichotomy in the pisanka world where you have these uh, you know these ready-made dyes and you can make a pisanka within you know a day right versus making a pisanka over the course of you know of course of a couple of days and using that time to kind of meditate and, and, and yeah I think I think the biggest thing like maybe what you're alluding to is like especially as we're trying to do this in community settings so I definitely have this um where I'm teaching a lot of workshops and doing this in spaces with people immediately so this doesn't really work for that yeah. unless we try to just do one or two colors in the span of two hours it's very possible like you just saw with the cochineal it is instant so we could adapt to that um, but many of us are still using aniline dyes for workshops and we're kind of unfortunately sort of in this economic model of producing something people want a product people want an experience we want to do this thing so that's not the origin of this tradition and that's why that um wasn't really a part of the um yeah of the of the material makeup of this um one thing that's amazing i think is that people's consciousness about the the um consequences of using these dyes is growing and just in general basically these aniline dyes are just the same chemicals that have dyed mostly all our clothes if we're wearing anything today that was made in a factory so that wasn't dyed by somebody you know or whatever right so it's the same components so we're participating already in that culture but when we make such a sacred object as a pisimka and it's so easy to make an onion skin dye yeah. it's just I really want to encourage you to try a, a different way Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Bushana. Thank you for all the things that you've taught us and, and even just get us in that headspace of how this was actually done and you know how that is so important into kind of understanding the real sacredness of this of, of the object of the pesanka. Um, and how that, you know, making the dyes just gives us a totally a different understanding of what this process is for, right? So thank you so much for that. And um, we love partnering with Folk Camp and, you know, being able to bring um, these, these new traditions, these old traditions to new audiences. And, and thank you so much for doing that for us. And oh, yeah. um, if, okay. if anybody gets to make a person can in, in, the, yeah, in the foreseeable share. future, share them, please do, right? Like, uh, I know that SBI would love to see them. And I know you could send them to, I think it's cultural.svi at gmail.com. I think if we could put or that in the chat. Or please send them also to me. Maybe you can or double. Or to Bojana. 
which is easy, this folk life at gmail.com. Um, I just see Jenny's question about her cochineal diet. Um, uh. Cochineal muddy. Um, yeah, I feel like that's maybe happened to me once. I'm not sure what might have happened. Um, and what do you mean by muddy? Is it the actual liquid or is it the result you got on your egg? And then um, there might be a couple of factors, maybe the, um, I'm not sure if they were kind of crushed or kind of water you used or the temperature, did you boil them? Yeah, so I, I don't know, but it, you have my email anyways, Jenny, or my contacts, so we can touch base about that maybe um, personally. Yeah, please, please share. And also, um, what was I gonna say? Well, I just, I guess I just wanted to thank you. And I really want to thank uh, Helena and Karen because uh, we had just talked with um, with Helena about this, I think in December. And I, I we, we weren't sure whether this would work. I, I wasn't sure how much um, this would be a workshop. It's obviously just turned into a lecture and we talking at you and answering all your questions. But I'm really uh, glad that we gave it a chance and that uh, we got so many people to join from all over. So that's cool. It's amazing. No, it's amazing. And I think that the idea, you know, even though we can't you know, probably not do it together the way we'd like to in a, in a, in a, you know, in a live environment, you know, there's lots of people coming from all over the world that are listening to this and, and, and maybe thinking about how they can utilize the, perhaps the natural substances they have in their environment to produce dyes. So that's, that's an amazing, an amazing uh, opportunity for, for everybody to, to be able to listen to, to, you know, kind of being experimental. Yeah, it's hard to do it in person in a two hour workshop. So this is actually a great format. And um, Mariana Svarnik did make an excellent, um, uh, what are those things called? PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> she, made a, she made an amazing PowerPoint presentation, which we actually partnered with her to bring her to Capital Ukrainian Festival a couple of years ago, well before the pandemic. And I'm pretty sure she made it available. Oh, she actually showed it at the Pismka uh, event at St. Vlad's, the one that's organized and put on by accessories. And it was in June or May. Um, right. The sort of Pismka conference thing. Yes, like Pismka conference. That's right. She yes. gave a presentation, I believe, also Middleslava Boykiv did. And I believe that that's available on her, um, on her website. And this is just the beginning. I've really for years wanted to make much more information available about this because like I mentioned, there's a few books here and there. This Irena in Ukraine has an amazing website, but nothing is in English. So I'd like to have more of this available to people eventually to have it all comprehensively laid out on a website. So pending funding and like time to do that, uh, it'll be much more um, accessible for everybody and you'll be able to, to, um, amazing. to see it online. And just to let everybody know too, this has been recorded. So we will have the um, this uh, recording available online on the SVI YouTube channel. So if you've missed anything or if you want to listen to this again, there is an opportunity for you to do that. We are going to, I'm not sure exactly when that will be up, but probably in the near future uh, for you to um, go back and listen and, and hear anything that you might have missed. Um, it will be available. And uh, speaking of funding, uh, we want uh, to make sure that this programming is available far and wide and we make them free to the public and we acknowledge uh, the generous support of the Shevchenko Foundation, uh, the Timarte Foundation Community Development Fund, the Seuss Foundation of Canada, um, the um, St. Vladimir, uh, Vladimir Foundation and the Delta Bingo and Gaming. Um, which also provides us with funding and as well to the Corinna, the music that you heard at the beginning of the presentation was um, made by Corinna, which is an amazing group um, and they sang the song Vesnyanke uh, and which is appropriate for this event because Vesnyanke means uh, the spring rites, right, the spring songs that we sing in the spring. So you heard some spring, um, spring rite songs that were sung um, at the beginning of this, um, the beginning of this uh, presentation or this event. And uh, we have to get dedicated this event to those who have been affected by the war in Ukraine. And if you can, uh, we encourage you to um, uh, help Ukraine by making a donation. Um, and there are a lot of people have been asking where to, to, to donate. We have a couple of um, uh, organizations that we'd like to propose. Um, and uh, we have our in-house organization, the Ukrainian uh, Canada Ukraine Foundation has partnered with the Ukraine Canadian Congress in establishing the Ukraine uh, Humanitarian Appeal. And um, donations can also be made to other credible organizations like the Friends of Ukraine Defense Forces Funds, Help Us Help, um, and the Red Cross uh, uh, Ukraine Humanitarian Crisis Appeal. 
And uh, all of these can be found online, helpsaveukraine.com. And uh, so if you want to research where, you know, you think would be best for you to, to, to help, um, those, all those uh, charities are, are available to be viewed. And we'd like to keep you in our family. So make sure that you come continuously um, come and check with us on Facebook, on Instagram, our web pages, uh, participate in our programming. We love to see you. We're so happy to see so many of you here today. Uh, 65 is an amazing number, Bojana. You bring them in. <laughs> I've got to say, it's an amazing number. Thank you so much. Um, and, uh, you know, cultural programming is a key to SBI's mission. It's our, it's our, and our history and our legacy. And it's our key to um, strengthening our identity and community uh, of Ukrainian, uh, of, of people of Ukrainian uh, descent, but also making sure that people have access to this uh, beautiful uh, tradition. So we're happy that you're here. Um, and we're so uh, pleased to, to have you back. If we, we want to come back to see our programming we'd love to see you and uh so uh without further ado i'd like to give you guys all um a little bit of a kind of letting you know what's happening and coming on up um the ukrainian museum of canada ontario branch uh has a beautiful exhibit called legends and legacies of borshiv if you have a chance to go and see it it is amazing um and uh, the blouses are exquisite uh, and that's going on um as an exhibit and it's running um i'm not sure until when but you know don't don't miss it um, and on Sunday, May 15th, we also have another presentation by Olha Zaitseva Herz, uh, who uh, will be singing Ukrainian folk songs uh, from the Carpathians and from the Canadian prairies. So lots of fun things happening at SVI. So please uh, don't, um, don't go far. We want to we wanna see you and, uh, and we hope to see you very, very soon. And Yakuyu Bojana Znovo, thank you to Tamara and to Karen who made sure that this was all properly, properly hosted and uh, to SVI for holding all these wonderful events. Thank you so much and hopefully see you soon. Slavo Ukraini.